I'll go ahead and kick us off so we can keep on time. Hi everyone, I am Victoria Ball Sheridan and I'm the Executive Administrator um, at the Weinstein JCC. I'm so thankful um, to have you guys here and welcome you to this program. We're very excited to put something on even if it is just virtual. Hopefully someday soon we'll be able to be in person again. Um, so the Global Day, of, this is our second annual Global Day of Jewish Learning um, and it was established to create um, learning opportunities and connect uh, Jewish communities all over the world. So we're very glad that we're able to participate with this along with other um, global institutions. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go over a few ground rules to make sure this session goes well. And uh, Rabbi Huva, feel free to pipe in if you have any specific things that you want people to do. Um, so there is a chat box. I see some people are already familiar with it and thankful for it, uh, are already using it. So. Um, please feel free to put any questions, comments, concerns down there um, to make things move smoothly. It looks like everyone is on mute, which is also good. Um, that will help cut down on feedback and make sure things also run smoothly. Um, and then let me pull up one more thing, Rabbi Ahuva's bio. So I'm sure many of you are very familiar with Rabbi Ahuva and we are thankful to have her here. Um, rabbi Ahuva Zaks is the solo rabbi and director of education at Congregation Ormi on the south side of Richmond. She currently chairs the Richmond Council of Jewish Education and is the immediate past chair of the Richmond Rabbinic Council. Rabbi Ahuva has published many Jewish prayers, songs, and poems in a number of reform, zidurim, and publications. She was ordained from Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles before moving to Richmond in June. Thank you for being here, Rabbi Huva. Take it away. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to share a PowerPoint. Go. All right, can everyone see a PowerPoint? Perfect. Yes. So today's topic is moving from the margins to the center. What Jewish commentaries can teach us about the inherent dignity of marginalized populations? Um, so this is in light of our theme this year for the Global Day of Jewish Learning of Human Dignity and looking at the dignity of those on the margins. So first, I'm going to start by looking at the format of a page of Talmud. Most books that we have looked at before tend to follow the format on the left where you have one big rectangle. If you're reading an academic paper, maybe there will be rectangles or paragraphs that are slightly indented, but for the most part, that's the shape of a text that we're used to. The Talmud is very different in that you notice multiple rectangles and some odd shapes that go around the original rectangle. And we'll talk about what those pieces are on the page. So here we have a handy dandy color coded chart you can see kind of the salmon color pinkish um, box shows in the Talmud, we start with the Mishnah as the core text that we're looking at. And the Mishnah is the foundation of rabbinic Judaism, which kind of explains how to bring the Torah into contemporary life for the time of the rabbis. Then we have a commentary on the Mishnah called the Gemara. Together, Mishnah and Gemara equal the Talmud. But then we have commentary on the commentary. We have the blue box is Rashi talking about the Gemara, which is talking about the Mishnah. And then we have commentary on the commentary on the commentary, right? We have uh, sometimes the disciples of Rashi, the Tosafis, will incorporate some of his comments. Sometimes they'll completely agree with him. Sometimes they'll disagree with him, but we've got all these multiple layers of commentary uh, that create this Jewish discussion about so many different topics in life. So the commentary in the margins is significant enough to eventually merit its own commentary. And to ignore the commentary in the margins, to ignore the margins is essentially to forfeit knowledge, to forfeit insights, and to lose part of the truth. So if this is true of just paper and ink, 
How much more so is it true of human beings when we're talking about who's in the center and who's on the margins? So look at kind of society as if it were a page of Talmud. We've got the center versus the margins. So the person at the center of society is considered the norm or the default, or if you've got an electronic device, might be the factory settings, right? What do they send it to you as? If I were to ask someone, anyone here, to draw a person in five seconds or less, I'm not going to make you do that, but we could turn on the annotate feature, we'd probably end up with a stick figure kind of like this, right? You've got less than five seconds to draw a human being. This is what you have. What are the identity markers of this person that comes to mind in less than five seconds? Might be gender ambiguous person, but likely male um, and able-bodied, right? Everyone tries to draw as quickly as they can. Spine, two legs, two arms, eyes and a mouth if they have time. Uh, how do we know that this, these are the identity markers of this generic human being? Well, if you just look at the signs, right? next to a restroom, our stick figure of a human being looks most like the sign that signifies maleness and able-bodiedness. We consider that in many ways the norm and the center of society today. And we can see that also in uh, if we were to do a Google search of human being or person, um, the first search result would likely be um, a male, able-bodied, white, middle class, maybe wealthy, and heterosexual. That's kind of what many movies are about, kind of the default person in our society. So you can see that in a Google search, you can see that in um, the main character of many movies. The Talmud was written on, in a different society, right, under Roman rule over 1500 years ago, where the default person was Roman, male, able-bodied, free, as in not a slave, and then wealthy or at least um, land owning to be like a citizen. And the Talmud comes from this culture, but in contrast to kind of the Roman default, instead of making Romans the default person, the Talmud makes Jews the default with consideration of non-Jews. Um, there's discussion of men, women, and intersex people in the Talmud. There's discussion of free people, slaves, and half-slaves. So it's very interesting when this, someone has like two, um, like two people are like, hey, do you want to go have these on a slave, right? One of them says, I'd like to free this person. The other person has not freed them. You end up with a half-slave, half-free person, which is a very complicated legal category that the Talmud discusses. Then we have um, discussion of able-bodied and disabled people. Um, as well as discussions of wealthy and poor people um, within the Jewish community and outside of the Jewish community. So we'll start with the Roman versus Jewish identity. So centering Jewish voices rather than the dominant Roman voice, Jews were a minority in the Roman Empire. Um, if we want to give the most generous number, maybe 10% of the population was Jewish. So 90% of people weren't Jewish, didn't really care about what it meant to be Jewish or Jewish needs. But the Talmud changes that. All of the oral tradition that becomes the Talmud is really telling your own people's stories, telling your people's culture, what matters to you um, as a group legally and in other ways. So the Talmud centralizes Jewish voices at a time when it, Jewish voices were minority voices that could easily be ignored. And through the Talmud, um, the minority becomes the focus rather than the margin. And that's effectively defying the norms of that time and place. Overall, the creation of the Talmud asserts three things. That Jewish identity matters, Jewish thoughts matter, and Jewish practices and laws matter. So despite making Jewish voices central, the Talmud also discusses non-Jews. So even as we're making a minority the focus, it's not that we ignore others in society. So many of the discussions about non-Jews um, that we find in Jewish teachings, including the Talmud, um, are based on ideas from the Torah itself about welcoming the stranger or the outsider, someone from the margins of the Israelite community. 
So one of the first big examples we see of that is of the mixed multitude, or in Hebrew, the Erev Rav, which is a group of non-Jews who left Egypt um, with the Israelites. So they also weren't too happy with things under Pharaoh and said, hey, we're going to go with you. And they were just embraced. And their presence is described in the Torah as being a part of the community. And even after this moment of the Exodus, there continued to be non-Jews who encounter Jews and sojourn with the Israelites. And they're considered basically equal citizens, despite coming from a different background. So we see an example text in Leviticus that says, The stranger that sojourns with you shall be to you as the native born among you. You shall love him as yourself. So someone who, was, who came from the margins is absorbed into the center community. And then the rabbis of the Talmud make an official um, process to convert to Judaism so that no one can say, oh, well, you're an outsider. There's uh, a ritual and um, the ger, the stranger, becomes the ger tzedek, which is a righteous convert to Judaism. And that person is then considered just as Jewish as someone who happened to be born Jewish. So there's no more outsider status. It's just complete inclusion in the center. So we have the focus is on Jews in the Talmud, but as I mentioned, there's still discussion of non-Jews and respect for non-Jews. The Torah doesn't begin with an event that focuses only on Jews. So you might think if the Torah is only about and for Jews, that it should begin with Mount Sinai, where you have this covenant with Moses, with all the mosaic laws that really define Judaism. But this, the Torah doesn't begin with that. It begins long before with the creation of the world, a more universal event that any person, animal, plant, droplet of water, right, is a part of that story. And the first human beings mentioned in the Torah were not Jews. Adam and Eve were not Jewish. The first person described as having a covenant with God was not Jewish. That was Noah, right? And we have the story of the rainbow at the end of the flood showing that um, God would never flood the earth again. That's the sign of the covenant with Noah. And the rabbis of the Talmud continue this um, respect for non-Jews and have various teachings like the righteous people of all nations have a share in the world to come. So this is in contrast to um, some religious traditions that say, you know, if you want to be saved or you want to be a good person, you have to be our exact religious denomination. We don't have that in Judaism. We know that you don't have to be Jewish in order to be a good person. The rabbis of the Talmud thought that being a good person or being righteous was basically following seven laws. Um, many of them are similar to the Ten Commandments. So you have sort of no idol worship, no cursing God, no murder, no theft, no adultery or bestiality. Um, an interesting law about not eating the flesh of a living animal. So if you're hungry, you can't just walk up to a cow, rip its leg off, have a barbecue and let the cow suffer, right? You have to um, make sure that the animal is not in pain. And then most of the laws are don't do this, don't do that. But there's one law that uh, you shall establish courts of justice. So having a sense of justice and fairness in society was uh, what the rabbis of the Talmud thought makes anyone a good person, whether they're Jewish or not. So if you're not Jewish, there's only seven rules to worry about. If you're Jewish, there's 613, right? So there's 606 rules that don't apply to non-Jews and are not necessary to make you a good person. So we've looked at kind of the Jewish um, and um, not Jewish distinction about identity. Let's look at another piece of identity that could be marginalized or put in the center. So specifically gender. So the Talmud certainly reflects the time and space that it was um, created, where it was created. Um, it focuses a lot on men and the concerns that men have, but it also talks uh, quite a bit about women. 
There's an entire order, one-sixth of the Mishnah is called Nashim, which means women, and focuses on a lot of things that would be relevant to the lives of women in that time. So there's a lot of discussion about women's bodies and concerns, including childbirth, menstruation, even the female orgasm is mentioned in the Talmud multiple places. Um, you have recognition of women's roles in society, especially that women end up doing the vast majority of child care, uh, which leads to uh, an idea in the Talmud that women are not obligated to do things that are done at a certain time because women are presumed to be busy keeping the people alive, right, taking care of children, feeding their families, all of those things. Um, so they're not required to drop everything and do uh, what the men are doing. There's also consideration of women's financial needs, particularly in the case of divorce. So you have the marriage contract, um, which comes from Talmudic discussions about, you know, the financial aspects of marriage in particular. So there's also in the Talmud recognition of female spiritual leadership. So you have seven female prophets who are specifically named. So they're identified as prophets uh, many of them are identified as prophets specifically in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. But um, some of them, the, the rabbis deduce more that they were prophets like Sarah and Esther. So you've got prophet status, which is the most direct connection to God. And then later on, um, when prophecy is considered to be over, the next most direct connection you have to God is through text and scholarship, Torah study. So even then you have famous women who are Torah scholars. The, probably the most famous woman who's a Torah scholar and mentioned in the Talmud is a woman named Beruria who was married to a rabbi named Rabbi Meir. And Beruria was said to have been like basically a genius. Uh, she learned 300 traditions from 300 different scholars in one day. Um, typical Tuesday for her, right? Um, there's a number of incidents in the Talmud where she's specifically described as kind of schooling people, right? That who don't know their Torah well enough. Um, she tells her own husband, like, how to interpret a biblical verse. She has this debate with a heretic about this verse in Isaiah. She teaches another student that it's actually better to study your lesson out loud rather than to try to learn Torah in complete silence. So she has a lot of teachings, uh, not only for her family members, but for students in the community and even heretics outside of the community. So um, something particularly interesting about um, the rabbinic understanding of gender in the Talmud is that it goes beyond just male and female. So I think many people are familiar with this verse from Genesis where it says God created the first human being, right, in God's own image, and God created them male and female. So some people will take that verse and say, see, there's only male and female, but there's a term called merism, which means um, basically a phrase that says uh, one end of the spectrum and another end of the spectrum and includes everything in between. So probably the most familiar merism we know is young and old, right? Um, when you say everyone, young and old, loved it, right? Um, you're not just saying that children and the elderly loved it, but middle-aged people hated it. When you say everyone young and old, you mean everyone in between as well as those on the ends of the spectrum. So, medically speaking, um, approximately one in every 1,000 to 2,000 births is of an intersex child, which means a person who can have sexual characteristics of um, maleness and femaleness. Um, the rabbis of the Talmud, right, they talked a lot about childbirth. They were familiar with childbirth and the fact that many babies, when they were born, uh, it wasn't easy to just say, oh, it's a boy or it's a girl when they're looking at the newborn. So there's two main terms for intersex people in the Talmud. The first one is androginos, which is a person who is born with both male and female genitalia. And then the other common term is tumtum, which is a person who has no visible genitals whatsoever. 
So this is, um, you know, coming from a time before they knew what chromosomes were. Um, they maybe had slight understanding of um, kind of internal sexual characteristics, like whether someone had ovaries or testes if they weren't visible. But a lot of gender identity was based on what um, genitals were visible, particularly when a child was born. Because you, if you're like, oh, we have a son, you have to arrange the bris pretty quickly, you know, within about a week. Um, so there are some practical implications of figuring out what gender is. The androgynos is uh, mentioned 149 times in the Mishnah and Talmud, and the tum tum is mentioned 181 times. So it's not just a you know, obscure once in a lifetime reference to uh, people who don't fit into the kind of extremes of the gender spectrum. There are many, many examples. We're not going to look at all of them because we don't have all day. We're just going to look at two for now. So in the tractate Brachot of the Talmud, we see um, a tum tum is considered both male and female depending on what makes sense for their situation. So, with regard to a tum tum who betrothed the woman, the betrothal is considered a valid betrothal due to uncertainty as the tum tum might be a male. So, if you happen to be a tum tum, you could marry a woman. Um, and similarly, if the tum tum was betrothed by a man, the betrothal is deemed valid um, due to uncertainty as the tum tum might be a female. So, um, you could also marry a woman. So it doesn't really matter. You have that option as a tum tum of who you'd like to marry. And then we see in the Mechilta de Rabbi Yishmael, which is a source of Midrash on the book of Exodus, the second book of the Torah, which is sometimes quoted in the Talmud. It says, just, of, uh, just as with the mitzvah of observing Shabbat, there is no distinction between a man or woman. Everyone gets the day of Shabbat off. Um, so too, with the mitzvah of honoring one's parents, there is no distinction between man or woman, tum tum or androgynous. Like, so you can't say, um, like, oh, I don't have to, you know, respect my parents because that only applies to men or women, and I am neither of those. Right? The mitzvah still applies. So you owe other people respect, and they owe you respect, regardless of gender. So, unfortunately, many cultures um, marginalize intersex and transgender people, but the Talmud makes it clear that the Tum Tum and Androgynos are people who are made in God's image and deserve the same level of respect as every other person. So, also made B'Tselem Elohim in God's image. So, I'm going to open the chat for a second. Um... Did Androgynos uh, folks have similar ability to marry whomever they wanted? Um, was it considered kind of like marriages involving a tum tum? So, good question. Um, the status of the androgynos like really depends on the situation. Um, in many cases, they're treated more like men because um, they have some male characteristics. But there is some ambiguity and some wiggle room there uh, to what their social role is. So some of it's what's chosen, what their family chooses. And there's even some discussion pretty early on when you have an intersex baby, um, do you just leave them as they were created? Or if they want to have a surgery to change their genitals in some way and live in a different um, social matter, is that permitted? And it is. So you already see, like, a long time ago, uh, what many people see as a precedent for um, transgender identity, which can have um, an impact on marriage roles and other things. So I hope that answers your uh, question somewhat, that in some ways the tum tum and androgynous are, um, they're linked together a lot, but there are some distinctions between them. Um, and an androgynous is definitely um, able to marry a woman and I think also able to marry a man. But we know for sure the tum tum was allowed. Okay. So we looked at differences in the body as it relates to gender and identity and who's marginalized versus um, in the center of society. Also look at... Um, 
other differences that occur within the community. So um, some people are born with or develop various um, physical, visual, auditory impairments, and the Torah addresses um, people in that situation and everyone around them and tells them how we should be treating each other. So in Leviticus, the Torah says, do not curse a person who is deaf and do not place a stumbling block in front of a person who is blind. So there's a recognition that some people have a tendency to be cruel. They think like, oh, ha ha, wouldn't it be a fun prank to trip this blind person, right? Um, the Torah specifically forbids that. I'm going to pull up the chat again. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's also in the Talmud, this is kind of taken to the next level, that not only are you not to make fun of someone who has differences, but you're supposed to specifically remind yourself when you see someone who looks different from you that that person was made by God just as you were. And so you say a blessing um, recognizing God as that person's creator and that God has made everyone unique. So this blessing is known as Mishane Habriot. Um, Mishane comes from the root of differences. So, and Briot means creations or creatures, right? So you, you're a creature, I'm a creature. We're all created by God and we're all created uniquely with um, these differences and different experiences and abilities. So there are some disabilities that are um, visible that other people can kind of easily detect but there are also invisible disabilities including intellectual disabilities and the book of Proverbs talks about how we educate our children that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to educating individuals that and the Talmud kind of expands upon that and turns that into uh, kind of customized education for each child and adult that every person has an obligation to learn Torah some people will learn easily from books others might need to learn through singing right and there's a whole um, tradition of learning Torah through music right kind of chanting Torah and even kind of doing a sing-song style to learn Mishnah and everything um, so there's a recognition that there are different uh, learning styles and abilities and a desire to accommodate the needs of every child and adult who are trying to learn. And likewise, we have a verse from the prophet Isaiah that says, um, my house, referring to the uh, God speaking uh, about the temple at this time in Jerusalem, but my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. So today we don't have the one central temple in Jerusalem, but we do have many local um, global right, synagogues um, that are effectively serving the same purpose of gathering for God's people. So we want to make sure that these spaces for the community truly welcome um, and accommodate the needs of everyone in the community. So a lot of synagogues over the past few decades have been thinking more about building ramps up to the bima um, or uh, making sure the sound system works well with hearing aids, uh, trying to make sure that um, there are good prayer service options and um, education options for people on the on the autism spectrum, right? And um, no matter what our differences are, that we're able to, you know, accommodate those differences and welcome everyone who's made in God's image. So uh, the last category we'll touch on is about differences in financial means. So some people have a lot of wealth, some people live in poverty, many people are kind of somewhere in between. Um, one teaching that we might find relevant comes from Hillel in Tractate Shabbat, which is that which is hateful to you, do not do to anyone. So if you would not like to suffer in poverty, don't let that happen to other people, right? Um, and the prophet Isaiah is more um, explicit about what to do. 
Uh, he says, share your bread with the hungry and take the wretched poor into your home. When you see the naked, uh, don't ignore them, like provide clothing for them. And then uh, we also see in the book of Proverbs, kind of next level is um, anyone who fails to um, give what is due to the poor is not only harming a poor person, but they are insulting God, right? The maker of that poor person. Um, and then in contrast, someone who is gracious and generous to the needy is not just being kind to that person, but is being good um, and honoring God as well. So a lot of these teachings emphasize the dignity of people living in poverty, um, which some cultures will just dismiss those in poverty. But um, Judaism tells us to think about those living on the margins, those most vulnerable and their needs and their dignity. So one example we see comes from the book of Leviticus, where it, it doesn't matter if someone is rich or poor or somewhere in between, that everyone has the same chance to harvest their own food, even if they don't happen to own any land. And you have to have money to own land, right? So um, there are like three different types of uh, food that one would harvest. So some of it comes from the edges of your field. Others are um, what you leave there while you're harvesting. And then the last one is anything you drop along the way. So all three of those categories um, are considered reserved for those on the margins. So even if you're like, oh, I forgot to you know, get that last bit of corn, well, you missed it, and that no longer belongs to you, even though it's your farm. Um, you leave that for the poor and the stranger, those who didn't have the chance to own land in that society. So everyone has access to food, and everyone um, who is able to go and get the food on their own uh, has the dignity of doing so. So, uh, so it's not that they have to stand on the street corner and beg, it's they can go um, to a place where they're legally allowed to pick their own crops. So we see that same level of um, dignity and maybe even uh, a greater level in the rabbinic tradition, um, specifically in the model of Maimonides' tzedakah ladder. So this comes from the Mishnah Torah, which Maimonides humbly named his own work the second Torah, um, where he explains all the Jewish law you'll ever need to know in a section about um, what should be given to the poor called Matanot Anim. And in this section, he kind of ranks the different types of tzedakah. So there's some people who um, they'll give, but they don't really feel like it and they'll scowl the whole time. You know, like imagine a kid who just got their allowance and then they're walking along and they see someone who's like, oh, can I have a quarter? And the kid's like, I don't want to. I was going to buy a toy with this, you know. Um, even if the kid's scowling, it still counts as tzedakah, but the best and highest forms of tzedakah, um, is giving someone the dignity of not having to rely on tzedakah to get by. So giving them a job that uh, pays enough for their needs is considered the highest form of tzedakah. And then the next highest forms are, um, also ensuring the dignity of the recipient where, um, the person getting the money doesn't know who gave it to them, and the person who gives the money also doesn't know who's getting it. So you can't have that awkward feeling of like always passing them in the hallway and being like, oh, I gave you money, or like, oh, I could only feed my children last week because that woman gave me money, right? Um, so you get rid of all those uncomfortable feelings um, and instead make sure that even someone relying on charity um, has the dignity of just having their, meet, their needs met uh, without having to feel indebted to anyone. So instead of just ignoring the experience of those on the margins, Jewish text invites us to get to know the marginalized as people made in God's image uh, with the same human dignity that we have. I'm going to open the chat. Uh, so Jewish tradition, right, has this 
idea of having commentary on top of commentary on top of commentary, which reminds us that uh, voices on the margin can easily become the voice in the center of the text, right? The center on which our thoughts focus. So a question for reflection would be what other marginalized groups or individuals could we learn from, right? Could, if we were to center their voices and listen, right? Instead of having them out on the margins, make them the central text. And uh, feel free to add some of your own thoughts into the, the chat box. But um, some resources that are already working to center voices that are often marginalized include um, an organization called Bechol Shon, which focuses on um, Jews from diverse backgrounds, uh, especially in America, but even around the world, because the majority of Jews are Ashkenazic, right, have this ancestry that goes back to Central and Eastern Europe, that has become kind of the dominant Jewish voice, like Jewish food is the food that comes from there, um, in many people's minds, but it's not the only... Judaism or Jewish culture that exists. So Bechol Lashon is a great resource to learn about Sephardic Jews and Ethiopian Jews, right? And uh, other Jewish cultures besides um, those that, you know, may have originated in Poland. If you're interested in learning more about the, the voice of refugees and immigrants, you can look into HIAS, um, which initially stood for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And began as an organization to help Jewish refugees and immigrants, but now um, does a lot of work with immigrants and refugees from all backgrounds. If um, you're interested in learning about Jews who are in recovery from addictions, and a lot of people suffering from addiction are marginalized, um, kind of kept out of the community in many ways, so if you're interested in resources about recovery or how to help a loved one in recovery, if you're struggling yourself, I re highly recommend the Elaine Breslow Institute. You can just Google that um, and find all kinds of resources there. And then if you're looking for books that specifically center marginalized voices, I would recommend uh, the Women's Tour Commentary. The editors are Eskenazi and Weiss. Um, it's all women. Uh, even if the Torah portion doesn't talk a ton about women, they will find something relevant to women's experience to make the central focus of the commentary for that um, portion. There's also a book called Torah Queries, which um, highlights LGBTQ um, thoughts and experiences around the, the Torah and various teachings. Let me pull up the chat again. And I will send this out, if possible, to everyone so you can uh, find all these resources. And you can also take a screenshot now if you'd like, but I'll, I'll try to send it out. Um, then there's a, a book called Judaisms, which uh, kind of like Behola Shon talks about different Jewish communities, in different times and locations, uh, different cultures. So if you feel like you've only had the chance to learn about Ashkenazi Jewish culture and you would like to learn about other Jewish cultures and practices, uh, that's a good book. It's kind of academic, so uh, you have to like kind of dense writing styles, but there's good pictures too, so it balances out. Um, and then the last resource, um, if you're interested in a prayer book that centralizes kind of LGBTQ Jewish life events, which might be different from typical um, what's considered, you know, the, the norm cisgender heterosexual experiences, um, Mishkan Ga'ava is a good resource for that. So um, that is, you know, a little bit about marginalized communities that we don't always hear a lot about and how you can learn about uh, more about their voices and how we as a community can learn to center other voices. So we're used to hearing some voices again and again, but there, there are other experiences and thoughts out there that we can learn from. So if anyone has any questions or thoughts, we have like one minute left. So. <laughs>
just a comment. Mm -hmm. This was awesome, and I learned a whole heck of a lot that some of it I knew about, but mostly not. And it's actually made me feel pretty darn good about a lot of issues. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And thank you. Yes, thank you. That was very interesting. That was good. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rabbi, and thank you guys for participating in this day. We're really thankful to have you here. Um, we hope to see you as the day continues. The next thing on the schedule is the Emic Shalom Kristallnacht uh, Remembrance Ceremony, which is virtual. Um, so if you've participated at, or if you've registered for that, that is at 2. Um, and then we will get back to it at 315 with Rabbi Beck Berman and Cantor Beck Berman. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, thank Victoria. You. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Have a good good day. to see you all.